It's a time of conflict and a time for courage. And America was creating heroes in the theaters of war and in the imaginations of millions of cinema goers. In 1942, while Gary Cooper, Spencer Tracy, and Clark Gable filled the screens with their charismatic personalities, in Chicago on July the 13th, a new film hero was born. His name was Harrison Ford. His father, Christopher Ford, was 35, a divorcee and a professional writer. His mother, Dorothy, was 24 and was an actor in radio dramas. Dorothy was Jewish. Christopher was an Irish Catholic. In those days, mixed marriages were rare. But after 1946, when Harrison's brother Terence was born, the Fords took advantage of their multi-ethnic heritage and deliberately introduced the boys to Chicago's cultural diversity. Harrison um, was taken to a variety of religious places, Catholic churches, Protestant churches, Jewish synagogues. And it was all part of encouraging Harrison to have an open mind and, and to be open to all possibilities. In the mid-50s, Ford attended a number of schools, fitting in at none of them. He was shy and something of a loner. His unusual upbringing and solitary nature made friendships difficult. He was relentlessly bullied. Harrison was the fish out of water. They used to throw him down the slopes outside the school. He wouldn't do anything. He'd just pick himself up, climb back up again. They'd throw him back down again. Two years later, when Harrison was 15, he was enrolled in Maine Township High School. There, he managed to conceal his insecurity by becoming the class clown and made himself useful by drawing sketches for school election posters. But Harrison remained a bit of a misfit and increasingly neglected his studies. His academic performance suffered, and as a result, he felt even more inadequate and eclipsed by his father's growing success. Christopher had become a prosperous advertising executive. In due time, he moved the family to the conservative, upmarket neighborhood of Park Ridge. Harrison's marks remained poor throughout high school, and it took the influence of a supportive teacher to get him into a college. In 1960, Ford entered Ripon College, a small liberal arts establishment to study English and philosophy. He relished the chance to widen his horizons, but the freer environment also allowed a rebellious streak in him to break out. He had to wear a jacket and tie to dinner each night. He had to do military training on Monday afternoons. He hated all that regimentation. The new student found a congenial atmosphere in Sigma Nu, where he and his roommate, Bill Haljam, formed a band. Folk music was big in those days, and uh, we created the Brothers Gross. We uh, were in high demand at Beer Blasts, which was the major activity on weekends at Ripon College. The probing discussions in philosophy also captured Harrison's imagination, and he enjoyed the praise of his tutors, but he was still, as he put it, downright lazy. He failed to complete his end-of-term paper on the playwright Edward Albee and was booted out of the class. Realizing he was not up to the task and knowing he'd failed to meet the academic standards his father expected, Harrison spiraled downwards into a deep depression. He found escape by deciding to switch course to the drama department and here he suddenly blossomed. The thrill of being someone else swept away the insecurities that had plagued him and soon Ford surprised everyone, including himself, when he demonstrated a natural talent for acting. He played uh, Mac the Knife at Three Penny Opera. I mean, he was uh, brilliant. I mean, the rest of everybody were just kind of walking around. Harry had this magnetism. For a long time, he'd been overshadowed by his father and his father's success. Here, at last, was an opportunity for him to assert himself and, and to, to shine. Heartened by his success and entranced by the words of great playwrights like Tennessee Williams and Bertolt Brecht, young Harrison decided to make acting his life and his career. But Harrison was impetuous, and in June 1964, one class short of the number of credits he needed to graduate, he dropped out of college. Ford also shocked his friends and family by announcing his engagement to Mary Marquardt, a fellow student who shared his passion for the theater. My prospective uh, in-laws who wanted to know what I was going to do for a living, and I said, well, I'm going to be an actor. They were a little shocked. My parents, um, I think, supported my ambitions. 
I don't think anybody had very much hope for them, but uh, I was supported. Luckily, Ford got a job almost immediately at the Belfry Theatre, where artistic director Bill Fusick, a former mentor of Paul Newman, saw the boy's potential talent. Bill Fusick saw a slightly dangerous, slightly interesting side to, to Harrison. He was very handsome as well, and he, he took a shot on him. Fusick's intuition was spot on. His hunch paid off. By midsummer 1964, Ford earned himself the coveted position of resident actor. With Mary as his rehearsal partner, set painter and soulmate, Harrison began to build his acting career. He took on the lead parts in some of the great plays and musicals of the day. By the time the couple got married, Harrison was convinced he had a future as an actor. The question was whether to go east to Broadway or west to Hollywood. Bill Fusick was very helpful, and he offered to put us up, my wife and I, when we first went to California. We spent a couple of months uh, living in his spare bedroom uh, while I looked for a part-time job. When Ford arrived in Hollywood, he found the movie colony to be dedicated entirely to glamour and frivolity, and the serious young actor couldn't fit into it. But while he was appearing at the Laguna Playhouse in John Brown's Body, a play about the American Civil War, Harrison Ford became noticed. Critics were calling him the best young actor in the area, and a talent scout quickly signed him up for Columbia Pictures. The studio instantly set about moulding Harrison's image to their own requirements, and as all young actors in the new talent programme, he was given a strict daily regime to follow. Columbia Pictures in the new talent program where one was expected to show up every day in a, in a jacket and tie to take acting classes, to uh, submit to publicity opportunities wherever they came from, and to generally be under the control of the studio. Early in 1966, the 23-year-old actor was given his first assignment for Columbia, a walk-on part in the James Coburn film, Dead Heat on a Merry-Go-Round. Paging Mr. Ellis. Paging Mr. Ellis. Boy. Bob Ellis. Robert Ellis, room 72. No, sir, Charles Ellis, room 607. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Oh. Paging Mr. Ellis. But a studio executive harshly criticized Harrison's performance. It was a severe dressing down for the young actor. He called me and he said, you're never going to make it in this business. And I said, oh, yeah. You know, and he said, well, I'll tell you the story. Tony Curtis delivered a bag of groceries in his first movie. You took one look at him and you said, that's a movie star. And I leaned across the desk and I said, I thought you were supposed to think that that was a grocery delivery boy. And of course, he threw me right out of his office. Not surprisingly, Harrison's time at Columbia Pictures was short. By the end of 1966, the United States was deeply embroiled in the Vietnam War. But Harrison, although required to register for the draft, had been exempted from service. I applied for conscientious objector status uh, during uh, the Vietnam War. I was unable to find a moral justification for being part of it. My wife became pregnant with Ben, our son. My status was changed to that of a father and we weren't being called at that time. Although Harrison was fortunate in not having to go to war, as a new father, he was in desperate need of funds. A great stroke of luck in the form of scout Walter Beekle recommended Ford for another new talent program, this time at Universal Studios. Westerns were the mainstay of the universal output, and the actor who'd cut his teeth on the great works of contemporary drama was told to saddle up and pretend to be a cowboy in shows like The Virginian. You shut up. No offense. We rob and steal because we don't have a rich granddad to pay for it. We kill because somebody sticks a knife in our ribs. Hapkin ring. I'm sorry. 
when I look at the early TV stuff, some of it's bloody awful. I hadn't found a way of discovering what it is that I should be doing. And often I couldn't get the answers to the questions or couldn't change anything enough to make it comfortable for me. Not only was Ford awkward in front of the cameras, he wasn't prepared to play the Hollywood game. He openly challenged directors and pursued bigger roles and generally gained the reputation of being difficult. Harrison found Hollywood deeply frustrating. As the rejections piled up, he became a more and more difficult character to live with. His wife Mary would ring friends up and ask fellow actors to come across and talk to Harrison to try and encourage him uh, to reassure him that one day he would make it. Yet even when given the opportunity to meet successful casting director Fred Roos, Harrison was surly and sarcastic. Nonetheless, the Hollywood pro saw something interesting behind Ford's tight-lipped exterior. He didn't come on in any kind of phony, friendly, trying to please way. Harrison wouldn't give an inch that way. He would, he would be exactly himself. But we warmed to each other. I think we talked for an hour, hour and a half. Roos had great difficulty selling his moody new protege, and Harrison grew increasingly despondent. He channeled his frustration by learning carpentry, working first on his own house before tackling projects on other people's. He boldly applied for and won the contract to build a lavish studio for Brazilian recording artist Sergio Mendes. After borrowing an armload of books from the public library, Ford took a hammer in one hand and a how-to guide in the other and set to work. By concentrating on making a roof, in a way it was his way of regaining his self-respect. Harrison Ford had become a known person in Hollywood, but despite his ambitions as an actor, it was as an expert carpenter that he'd made his name, not as a high-flying film star whose talents were in demand. But all of that was about to change. Where were you in 62? special one and jump into your candy-colored custom or your screaming machine, cruise downtown and catch American Graffiti. It's one of those great old movies about romance, racing and rock and roll. It was 1973 and American Graffiti was the hot new summer movie. A love letter to a simpler, gentler time, this nostalgic tale of fast cars and faster women was the creation of George Lucas, a protege of Francis Ford Coppola. It starred Richard Dreyfuss, Cindy Williams and Ron Howard. Among the cast was Harrison Ford, who at the age of 31 was featured in the role of bad boy, Bob Falfer. Hey doll, why don't you come on a ride with me? It's about 10 years. Now leave her out of this, it's just between you and me. Harrison would make suggestions, as a lot of the actors would make suggestions. Um, you know, Harrison wanted to wear a cowboy hat, so I let him wear a cowboy hat. There's always a collaboration that goes on between the actor and the director. The film's collaborative spirit inspired Harrison to throw himself into acting as never before. And he carried his enthusiasm off the set when he joined his co-star, Paul Lamat in some extra mural mischief. Harrison and I hung out together on our days off. He sort of uh, tricked me into going to the bars and drinking against my will, but I, I, I wanted him to feel good. I wanted to make him feel comfortable, so I went along with it. Well, they drank a lot of beer and threw beer bottles out the, their uh, motel window and cracked a Cadillac's windshield. And every day we would all talk about what they had done the night before. Did you hear what Harrison and Paul did? The popularity of American Graffiti launched the careers of several of its young actors, but it did little to enhance Ford's status in Hollywood. Dejected, he returned to making the rounds of auditions, but without much success. People didn't want to hire him back in those days. One thing I know he told me when he went on meetings, he wouldn't say anything. He would just sit in the room and kind of stare at the floor, which didn't help. Supporting roles in two more Francis Ford Coppola films at least kept the wolf from the Ford family's door. 
but by 1974, it included a second son named Willard, and as money became scarce, Harrison gave rein to his black moods, which put great strain on the marriage. Two years later, however, American Graffiti's director George Lucas was searching for an actor to play an intergalactic smuggler in his sprawling space epic Star Wars. Fortunately, casting director Fred Roos urged Lucas to consider Harrison Ford. I, I had been pushing George about it, about Harrison, because I thought he was on the money right for, for that part. He had a great sense of humor, a great sense of comedy. Using a devious stratagem, Roos hired Ford not as an actor, but as a carpenter to install a door at American Zoetrope Studios, which was adjacent to the building where Lucas was holding the Star Wars auditions. He was working on the door, and Fred had been pushing me to use Harrison, but I had in the back of my mind that he was a candidate. Uh, but once we started doing the testing, there was no question that he was the one. Ford was cast as Han Solo and joined two other relative newcomers in the cast. Mark Hamill played the youthful hero Luke Skywalker and Carrie Fisher played the rebel Princess Leia and all three of them together would take on the evil empire. Filming at Elstree Studios outside London, Harrison was in his element in the stimulating atmosphere of a lively production team. And, 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 and. Oh! Frame. The mic was in picture. The mic was in picture. The mic was in picture. I'm going back to first position. <laughs> the sound department has a fan. Harrison is a kind of scruffy, independent soul, and um, that's what Her that's what Han Solo is. So, in a way, there was a perfect match up there in terms of their personalities. Yes, Greedo. As a matter of fact, I was just going to see your boss. Tell Jabba that I've got his money. So. Yeah, but this time I've got the money. I don't have it with me. My dead body. But you have. Sorry about the mess. Ford had never been involved in a work of such complexity. He and Lucas created scenes which would later be seamlessly blended with special effects into a truly great film. In May 1977, Star Wars was released and quickly became a global phenomenon. It took $100 million at the box office in three months, faster than any other film in history, and its success put Harrison Ford on solid financial ground for the first time in his career. When Star Wars was successful, uh, things became more manageable, money-wise at least. Flying high on the enormous popularity of Star Wars, Ford appeared in Heroes with Henry Winkler and the next year in Force 10 from Navarone with Robert Shaw. In 1979, Harrison was cast in his first leading role. Hanover Street was a sizzling and sensual Second World War romance, co-starring Leslie Ann Down. But audiences decided that Hanover Street was a bigger bomb than any that fell during the Blitz. A cretinous film, the new statesman called it. Ford began to fear that the Star Wars force would always be with him. Adoring fans would only ever see him as Han Solo. Because there were two or three movies that he did after Star Wars, which weren't big hits, he was kind of written off as a fluke. I can only do one kind of character. In addition to problems to do with his career, Ford had troubles at home. 
He'd spent months on location abroad, and all the time apart, coupled with persistent rumors of infidelity, had finally chipped away the Ford's marriage. By the end of 1979, Harrison and Mary had separated in a dignified manner, but leaving deep wounds for both. Without any question, his greatest regret was the breakup of uh, his marriage to Mary and the loss of the family unit that he built there with the, with the two boys. Uh, it, it hurt him very deeply. A lot of parenting is really tough, especially when you were very young, as I was when my first kids were born. Clearly, it was not the best parent in the world. It wasn't good for our marriage. It wasn't good for me. Crushed by the ending of his marriage and stung by the failure of his latest film, Harrison was struggling. His life was unraveling. He left Mary in the home he'd renovated for them and moved to a house nearby to be close to the children. Despite these huge personal setbacks, Harrison Ford's greatest career triumph lay just ahead. He didn't know it yet, but he was about to become a superstar. Uh, what are you doing? You're not actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. In 1980, the Empire Strikes Back reunited Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, and Han Solo. It was another blockbuster success and grossed $365 million worldwide. On the crest of a wave, producer George Lucas began to develop his next project. Directed by Steven Spielberg, the movie was to star Tom Selleck in the role of Indiana Smith, whose name was later changed to Jones. But Selleck was committed to star in a CBS television series. When CBS refused to release him, Lucas and Spielberg turned to Harrison Ford. understands audiences very, very well. And I think he saw this picture, and he was one of the few people who got, got the concept of Raiders as a throwback to the old serials from the 1930s and 40s. As timely as tomorrow's headlines, the thrilling story of fearless United Nations secret agents matching wits with treacherous Nazi spies. Müde? Warum schläfst du? Wo ist dein Hemd? Wasch dich mal, damit du nicht aussiehst wie ein Schwein bei deinem Standgericht. Steh auf! The film called for stunts more dangerous than Ford had ever attempted, but he insisted on doing a lot of them himself. He did more stunt work as a leading actor than any other leading actor I've ever worked with in my career. During a climactic scene involving a propeller aircraft, Harrison severed a ligament in his right knee, but kept on shooting. However, Spielberg eventually discovered that his stoic star did have one weakness. I mean, he'll fight, he'll roll in the dirt, he'll fall off things, but when you get him wet, he's a little bit like when you get a cat wet. You know, he doesn't say, I don't want to get wet, or I protest the, the liquid of the shot. Never does that. But you can just tell that his mood gets a little darker. But I always see a cloud moving over his face when we bring out the big water hoses to, to, to drench him. Conversely, when heat and dehydration made it seem wise to cut a scene short, Harrison suggested that Indiana shoot first and ask questions later. We had this big sword fight, and it was going to take all day to shoot it. 
Harrison went to Stephen and said, uh, you know, if this were real, I would just pull out my gun and shoot the guy. One, the guy who had been practicing with the sword for months, was told he would swing the sword once and then get shot. He was appalled. So I pulled the trigger before he had a chance to even think about it, and he fell down. <laughs> and that's the shot we used. In Raiders, Harrison Ford created Indy as a hero who was larger than life, but was also sensitive and vulnerable. He suggested to myself and George, I don't want to be this movie star that by the end of this amazing adventure, after 19 cliffhangers, I have just a tiny little scar over my right eyebrow and I have a little dirt on my face. We had a lot of fun in the scene where he is really racked with pain and he had a wonderful line that he, Harrison made this line up himself. You're not the man I knew 10 years ago. It's not the years, honey. It's the mileage. He gives the audience permission to be Indiana Jones just by virtue of showing pain and showing fear and showing the fact that he's just, he's, he's a mortal character. When Raiders of the Lost Ark was released in 1981, it proved universally appealing to an audience of all ages worldwide. Harrison Ford had finally become an international film star. So he was now in the position to take on challenging risks, as he did in 1982, when he appeared in the dark science fiction thriller, Blade Runner. Off screen, the 40-year-old actor had a new partner, 31-year-old Melissa Matheson was a successful screenwriter whose credits included The Black Stallion for Francis Ford Coppola and the Spielberg blockbuster E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Melissa was an intelligent and independent woman, a Hollywood insider, and many people thought she would be the perfect match for Harrison Ford. In 1983, they were married in a private ceremony in Santa Monica, California. They hit it off immediately. She had a very acerbic, a very questioning uh, mentality. In Harrison, she found a real soulmate. When Ford came to England to shoot The Return of the Jedi, the final installment of the Star Wars trilogy, he brought with him the maturity born of the experience of many films and the confidence to reshape the audience's idea of the hero. few actors that's thought of and perceived of as a strong male role model who will cry in his movies. Just relax for a moment. You're free of the carbonite. Who are you? Someone who loves you. Well. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom was Ford's next project, and while he was now among the world's most popular action heroes, the star had yet to prove himself as the lead actor in a straight dramatic role. But he would soon have his chance in a film that would bring him more acclaim than he could ever have hoped for in a thousand years. In February 1985, Harrison Ford abandoned swashbuckling in spaceships and transformed himself into a Philadelphia detective called John Book. Co-starring Kelly McGillis and Lucas Haas, Witness told the story of an Amish family on the run from inner city crime. It also offered Ford a chance to prove at last that he was a serious actor of the highest caliber. How's he doing? What's your name? Samuel Vaught. Sam, the man who was killed tonight was a policeman. It's my job to find out what happened. The man that you saw, he was a... He was a big guy, like me. Big guy. In Witness, I was blown away by Harrison's uh, uh, interaction with 
uh, the young boy. The whole gentle side of Harrison, the patient side of Harrison, a whole other color I had never seen before. I thought the love scenes in Witness were amazing. He was able to do things in that picture. He was a much more complete human being in Witness than the character or the scripts allowed him to be in any of his prior work. Ford revealed himself to the audience as he never had before, and when the Oscars loomed into view, he was rewarded with a nomination for Best Actor of 1985. William Hurt won that year for Kiss of the Spider Woman, but Harrison had enjoyed a personal triumph. He proved that he could be in a movie, that he could carry it all by himself, that it didn't have either Steve or I directing it, but it'd be a huge success just with his name on it. Harrison now had the freedom to make choices most actors only dream of, all the while exploring his own complex nature for inspiration in his dramatic roles. There's the introverted Harrison Ford, but there's also the expressive, sort of uh, very outspoken Harrison Ford. And I think these two things work together quite well. I think that's the secret in many ways of his success. Over the next two years, Ford gave audiences an ambitious array of characters. A father gone mad in Mosquito Coast. A husband pursuing his wife's kidnappers in Frantic. And a corporate raider with Melanie Griffith on his mind in Working Girl. A Mr. Jack Trainer to see you, Miss McGill. Thank you, Cynthia. Hold all calls, Miss McGill. Yes, Cynthia, thank you. Can I get you anything, Mr. Trainer? Coffee, tea, me? <laughs> Isn't she right? That'll be all, Cynthia. Why did you say you weren't you last night? Because I knew what would happen. All mergers and acquisitions. No lust and tequila. What did happen exactly? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. I woke up in my underwear. I'll bet you look nice. By 1989, the undying popularity of Ford's character, Indiana Jones, had made the 47-year-old actor a legend in his own lifetime. And for the third installment of the series, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Sean Connery had been persuaded to play Indy's father. I had always wanted to do a father-son story with Indy. I'd always wondered who could his father be. And of course, his father had to be Sean Connery. I mean, nobody else could be the father of Indiana Jones except James Bond. Two days after the film opened, Harrison Ford was at the Smithsonian Institute to donate Indiana Jones's hat and jacket to the collection. I tried the hat on one last night. Despite his superstar status, Harrison knew that his fame wasn't as important as the need to continually challenge himself as an actor. He worked hard on his technique and began the next decade with a gallery of memorable film portrayals. In 1990, audiences thrilled to the tough moral choices faced by prosecutor Rusty Savage in Presumed Innocent. Harrison also stretched himself to play the mentally challenged Henry Turner in Regarding Henry. Ford was both action hero and family man in 1992 when he became CIA agent Jack Ryan in Tom Clancy's Patriot Games, where he starred opposite Ann Archer. Harrison's very professional. He knows what, what works for himself. By the time the camera rolls, the character's inside of him, and he knows who that guy is. He knows everything about him. Did I miss something? I'm pregnant. <sighs> Honey. <laughs> if you look at leading men, they have this simple, sort of real, very there quality. The camera captures that, and you can't take your eyes off of him. He's got great eyes. Uh, he can say a lot with his eyes. You can rip pages out of the script and cut the dialogue, and he'll still get the emotion across. Uh, one good example of that was a scene in Patriot Games where the CIA and the Air Force are making an attack on a terrorist camp in the Mideast, and they're watching it on satellite. That is a kill.
his instincts are so accurate as to what he does best that we ended up with a scene that worked out wonderfully and was an example of less is more. In 1993, Ford brought new subtlety to the character of Dr. Richard Kimball in The Fugitive, which was a film based on the popular television series. And one year later, he found success again as Jack Ryan, this time in clear and present danger. After 28 years in films, Ford was exactly where he wanted to be, at the top of his profession and having arrived there entirely on his own terms. You know, Harrison is not a you know, a really handsome kind of leading man. He's a more rugged, realistic, natural-looking leading man. I would sort of uh, equate him to a modern-day Clark Gable. I always thought that he was a strong reminder, for me, of Humphrey Bogart, a very young version of Humphrey Bogart. A master craftsman, Ford has approached acting as he once tackled carpentry, patiently creating enduring performances that have become the standard by which others are measured. I do love language and the play of language and well-written dialogue. I look for what kernel of information each scene has that can uh, progress the story. And then I look for behavior which will make that interesting, that kernel of information hopefully interesting to receive. In 1996, the 54-year-old actor, confident in his achievement and comfortable in his personal life, felt able to poke a little fun at his own public persona. On February the 20th, he endured the traditional Harvard University hazing, donning a Medusa wig and a bra to become the hasty pudding theatricals man of the year. Having made his mark on the history of cinema, Harrison could relax and smell the roses. But no, one challenge remained for the star of the world's most popular films, and to achieve it, Harrison Ford would have to outdo even himself. By 1997, Harrison Ford was at the top of his game, a Hollywood power player of the highest order, and he was now able to command a $20 million fee to star in Air Force One. Go on, Biat! Lucky day, but more can make people do. Tell the F-15s to fire at the plane. The computer will fly circles around any missile they fire at us. And no hit, just a shockwave. He's telling us what to do. Believe me, all that had happened is we'd get knocked off our feet. That's all. The thriller featured Ford as a kidnapped U.S. president battling against his captor, played by Gary Oldman, a terrorist who would stop at nothing to destroy American rule. The film's financial success was dazzling even by Harrison Ford's other blockbuster standards, bringing in an astronomical $37 million in its first weekend. But after 10 years of playing businessmen, CIA agents and lawyers, Ford was happy to lose the suit and tie and jump into a richly comic portrayal of a crusty aviator in six days, seven nights. I'm sorry. You're kissing me? No, for this. Harrison Ford. I really liked kissing you. Anne Heche. If I start, I'm not going to be able to stop. That's good. And isn't it? <gasps> Some sort of creature has just swum up my pants. That's bad. Although the challenge of filmmaking continued to hold its appeal for Ford, he began to use the rewards of his lucrative career, buying a small fleet of planes and flying them. Harrison's passion for flying is probably appropriate for a man who's always balanced freedom with discipline. I'd be quite happy to do it uh, for a living. I like to be challenged by learning new things. I like the machines, and maybe it has something to do with control. But it also has to do with a uh, potential for being humbled. 
uh, buy it at any minute. So you really have to pay attention to what you're doing. A veteran of the old century, Harrison Ford has proved himself a star for all ages in the new one. He's brought a refreshing informality to his public role of movie icon. In private, as husband and father, he's learned well the difficult lessons of youth. Harrison has matured into a stable marriage. His family grew to include a son, Malcolm, and a daughter, Georgia. And in 1996, his older son, Willard, made him a grandfather for the first time. He has also turned to philanthropic works, including joining his wife, Melissa, in her support for Tibetan human rights. And his privileged existence has allowed him to enjoy his privacy on an 800-acre ranch in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Harrison lives his life in the most normal way of many of my, my friends who were relatively obsessed with filmmaking. Uh, Harrison spends most of his time not thinking about films or scripts or what he should do next. He spends most of his time with his family, living in Wyoming. He's probably more normal than any of us. During his odyssey across the world's cinema screens, Harrison Ford has evolved from a wisecracking space cowboy into the quintessential film actor. His electrifying opening performance of the new millennium in the film What Lies Beneath marks him as a great screen actor for all time. The big secret of Harrison Ford's life that not many people know about, it's that in order to keep his fedora on as Indiana Jones, he uses a staple gun and he has to staple it to his head and that's how the hat doesn't fly off in the receipt. George will kill me for saying this, and so will Harrison, but that's how he does it. I never heard him talk about being a star. I think he just wanted to be a working actor. He's very interested in being real, and uh, well, you can see that by where he lives and the kind of life he has when he's not filming. I never had movie heroes or people in the entertainment uh, world were never heroes to me. You only work as part of a team and use your best efforts. I hope that I've learned something from that experience. The Biography Channel tells the story of the actor and singer Dean Martin tomorrow evening at the same time of 8 o'clock.